Hello and welcome to the second episode, or I guess second but first episode of what the currently untitled show right now is about Miami Vice. I have been calling it the Miami Vice cast, but who knows if that name will stick. Joining me as he did last week up in Seattle, Washington is John. What's going on, John? Not a whole lot. Actually uh, enjoying a little bit of spring weather up here. Liar. No, no, we actually got a there. full week of sun. <laughs> We got a whole week of sun up here. It is beautiful and Bro, it is sunny be... and see the grease. I'm telling you, I'm in shorts. And... <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's going to be 98 degrees here tomorrow. Oh, wow. In the land of the sun, it is no joke. It is the land of the sun. And it's already that time to be hot. We have the air conditioner on now, and I'm scared for summer. <laughs> well, hey, also... I'll tell you, it... Also it joining us... the 70s in the house here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess that's big for you. You know, I keep my air conditioner set at 80. Yeah, I don't own an air conditioner, so. (laughs) Well, joining us from the San Francisco Bay Area is Jenna, who doesn't know anything about air conditioners either. I don't need to. The weather's gorgeous right now. Are you kidding me? This is like peak California weather. I go through the tunnel and it goes from sunshine to Carl the Fog all the way. It's beautiful. You know, sometimes I wish we would get that. You know, what 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 we get is a light cloud covering, and like maybe like the rain is coming, but then it's gone. I just like the distinction, right? So I come when I first get on the train, and it's super bright. You got the green rolling hills, very picturesque, and then you come straight through, and it's all fog. It's totally gray. So kind of best of both worlds, I guess. Well, for watching the first episode of Miami Vice, I feel like I have something in common with the pe- with the people and the cast and the story of Miami Vice is that everyone you here in Arizona, <laughs> everyone here in Arizona is just as sweaty as the people are in in Miami Vice. I'm so glad that you noticed that because I've ac- I actually I had to stop and note why are they so sweaty? They're so sweaty. Just another confirmation that Arizona is the Florida of the West Coast. <laughs> You don't need a confirmation for that. <laughs> oh, man. And after that um, scene with the judge and everyone pulls a gun when the lights go out, it just confirmed yeah. to me that Florida has always been Florida. Yes. Yes. Actually, it's hard to tell but the difference between that and uh, people going to a Trump rally here in Arizona. They also get uh, that sweaty? Uh, Yes. <laughs> Anyways, let's get into talking about the pilot episode for Miami Vice, season one, episode one, a two hour, two parter episode, and our first real introduction to Miami Vice. And John, how about you kick us off? Okay, so um, immediately I see Jimmy Smith and I think, awesome, it's Jimmy Smith. And then he blows up immediately um so uh golf clap to the beginning of the episode uh, you know because right there i think and like oh jimmy smith is gonna be in this this is gonna this is maybe this is where he got his start and they killed him off just like bam there is no doubt like um, the show starts like right away there's no slow build up there's no like character building or anything like that it's like straight up 80s as 80s as you can get and right into the action like you start off in new york at yes. a club you know but at the same time there's yes, also exact. almost no dialogue i was tracking and it's a good like five minutes of just sort of montage like video and and other exterior sounds with no substantial dialogue that really struck me like the whole beginning of the episode that that there really is there's like no building to kind of get to know people they leave that very much for the whole second half of the of the episode and then even at the end of it i was surprised with how much i was able to take away that they didn't even necessarily introduce like things are are very subtle the way that they're kind of put out there yeah i mean but <clears throat> it was really like both storylines both for tubs and crockett like their stories immediately began with someone's gone die. How very yes, came exactly. Exactly. And that was kind of my point was like they immediately started off with car bomb and gun violence. Like they, they didn't they didn't uh, they, they didn't spend any time in anything up. They just jumped right into it, which I thought was nice. 
The other thing that was funny too is like like we talked about in the last episode where like in our, our kickoff on why we chose Miami Vice is that it's like the definition of the eighties, right? How they dressed, how people talked, how people act. Everything about it was the complete rep- representation of the eighties. And right out of the gate, like you get Tubbs. He's in New York. He's, you know, deep undercover. You don't know what what's going to happen with him yet. All you know is that he's like just this hardcore undercover cop in a real seedy area of New York. And right out of the gate, someone turn like the they come to him and tell him like if he thinks he's the next Michael Jackson. Can I just mm-hmm. ask why does he have a shotgun as his as his weapon? Like I mean, so you do come to know that he is a cop of some sort, yet he carries around like a sawed off in his car. Just struck me as strange. That whole scene with the thugs where they come up to the car, like, so the one of the thugs says, like, he thinks he's Michael Jackson. And then I'm looking at it and it's like, well, yeah, because one of you guys in the in this bad boy club walking around on the street look like something out of a out of the beat it music video. Uh-huh. <laughs> See, but and I think uh Jenna, I kinda uh similar to what you're saying with Tubbs is that um they clearly spent a lot of time writing Crockett and they let you know that right away. He's a former football star, a Vietnam vet, he has a pet alligator. Uh, lives on a boat like they went into detail so you knew crockett you don't know a whole lot about tubs i mean is he a renegade cop is he um like a lone ranger type or is he just going to be a simple sidekick and that's what i was trying to decide because you really don't know you don't learn as much about tubs as you do about crockett throughout the episode like you learn everything about crockett yeah, that's true. I mean, I got the feeling that they were trying to play it a little bit loose, that they had more confidence in, obviously, like in Don Johnson continuing forward, but wanted to be a little less, uh, like, in-depth with what they went into for Tubbs. So hopefully we get that in the second half of the premiere episode. I'm not sure. Well, I'm just, I'm wondering if he's mysterious so that he can, you know, they're on in the series when they need something, you know, it's, Oh yeah, and I'm a classical uh, pianist, and I can fly a helicopter. You know, like I'm wondering if that's the angle they're taking, or if they weren't sure if Tubbs was going to be the sidekick yet, and they were, and they were waiting to see how people, uh, uh, what people thought of him, um, in case they wanted to write him out of the show. That that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, exactly, because I got the feeling that the that it was the latter, that they wanted to just play it a little bit safe in that pilot episode or the first couple of episodes just to make sure that the feelings were going to be supportive. Not to mention that the couple times that they really make sort of tubs heavy scenes like that stripper or the strip club scene, um, he's kind of ridiculous. I mean, and I mean this in the best way possible because I really enjoyed that whole scene, but he kind of he starts singing and then he's dancing uh like below as the strippers dancing and he's almost just enjoying himself more than her and the moment and and i'm curious about what that like how that plays out in terms of his personality later on yeah and i definitely that's actually one of my notes is i actually wrote you know tubs looks like he's more fun than crockett that was one of my notes well yeah because (laughs) tubs is supposed to be like He's the swinging bachelor. He's the ladies' man. In, in every scene, he's looking at, he's checking out the women when they're walking by. Rocket, on the other hand, he's like, he's divorced. He's got kids. You know, he's, he's in love he, with his ex-wife. Yeah, he's he, exactly, exactly. He's still got feelings for her. She's like conflicted about what her relationship is with him. She knows that she can't be back with him, but she still cares about him because he's a good dad. I mean, mm-hmm. stereotype galore. Full everything is a stereotype in that movie, including in that scene that that you're talking about with Tubbs, where he's in the strip club and he's dancing around. Remember earlier in the like 15 minutes earlier, someone on the street said that like, he thinks he's the next Michael Jackson. Then you go to the club and the song that's playing is let me look here. It's a song. Sorry, I'm looking through my notes. I got to see where it is. Oh, is it? Wait, is it body talk? It's Somebody's Watching Me by Rockwell. So ah. Rockwell, he sings that song, but the chorus is sung 
I'm Michael Jackson. Oh. Yeah. Huh. You know what it made mm-hmm. me think of? And correct me if I'm wrong on the movie. I mean, on the yeah, on the movie. But it reminded me of when we watched No Retreat, No Surrender with the with his friend, and like how he's super canny as like the token oh, yeah. the token minority friend, you know, mm-hmm. where like he would just break out into dance every once in a while and like <laughs> yeah. make his own beat. Like I can imagine that you know, like teenage tubs just do that, walking down the street making up his own beat, <laughs> like breaking out into a dance. Yeah. So, I mean, it starts off really fast, and uh, you're right. Like with Crockett, you learn so much about him right in the beginning. Like I was saying, you know he's divorced. You know that it was a it was a messy divorce because they still have feelings mm-hmm. for each other. But he's a bomb ass dad. See him over there laying in bed with his kid. He fell asleep after after his partner gets killed. He falls asleep in the bed with his son. Right? It was his son, right? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So like yeah it would have been creepy it wasn't (laughs) (laughs) this random child that he's sleeping in the bed with but on top of all the stereotypes like everything is way over the top so like when with the car bomb tub you know not tubs but crockett bends down he sees underneath the car and you see the bomb underneath the car and it's like comical wily coyote bomb wired up to the gas tank right two bright red wires Uh and a silver box with a big old red switch on it (laughs) yeah that whole scene was pretty ridiculous and honestly it felt like even worse just because they had just introduced that his wife was what like five months pregnant or something like that Mm -hmm. so it's just heart-wrenching that whole scene in the diner after was horrifying to me like i just i I can't imagine how they could have played that out to be any different i guess but at the same time like it felt very it felt very off from the rest of the from the show thereafter because they basically forget about that entire thing like Obviously, it starts out. That's what I'm saying. His partner dies, and his wife is now bereaved, working at some like greasy joint, uh, you know, in downtown Miami. And you you, like you feel bad, but you're almost immediately ushered into forgetting about that and focusing on this dynamic between him, him and Tubbs. And it like never jumps back to that. Like, what's she doing? Like, what's she gonna do? Nope, nothing. Schmidt was an extra. That, that, like I said, like, like just seems like a whole character. Uh huh. Well, not just that, but I mean, um, I am looking at their police work a little bit w- during this episode, and some of the things that I noticed, and I don't know if this is what it's going to be like throughout the whole um series, but um, Crockett's pretty much his whole undercover persona is he's a guy with a boat. Um, uh, and. You mean that you wouldn't trust a guy in pastels who owns a boat and an alligator to buy your drugs from? I mean, that feels like like, like key drug cartel signifiers right there. It it seems like the only thing that qualifies him to be undercover is the fact that he advertises that he has a boat. Like, at least with Tubbs, he's got the Jamaican accent. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. Oh, God, it was just (laughs) so bad. For, For, like, at least the first half of the episode, I couldn't tell whether or not he was intentionally slipping into that or not like i just i didn't realize that that was a thing that he was trying to do which of course is like my mistake like it's super obvious but i like i just i thought that maybe every once in a while they were just trying to play up that he was actually jamaican actually this is like the first that i'm hearing that he was supposed to be jamaican (laughs) (laughs) i had no idea (laughs) yeah no dude he Dude, yeah, yeah. I no, my my note specifically was Jamaican me crazy, because <laughs> because it was an awful Jamaican accent. He kept using it in the undercover situations. He was playing a Jamaican guy. Well, I mean, you're right. There's no way that both of these guys work undercover, especially Crockett, that he's undercover all the time and no one has figured it out. You know, and and you're right. Like his only thing that he's got is that he's got a really fast boat. That's why everyone wants to work with him. And, of course, when you find out that that's Uh the reason why he's popular is that he's got that really fast speedboat, what happens? Tub steals the speedboat, and there's got to be a land versus water race. (laughs) Yeah, which, by the way, Tubbs 
just drive away from the dock. Just go. <laughs> on the ocean, son. Roads don't go into the ocean. Okay, okay so let's, let's cover. Let's let's back up a little bit and look at like. Okay, so we had the opening scene where you meet Tubbs. He's in New York City. He's working undercover. He's found the guy. That he he's finally located the guy that he's looking for. It. He chases after him and ends in a shootout, which that bad guy, who ends up being the main bad guy that they're going after for, for, for the whole episode. He is so 80s that he's even got Lee press on nails on. Uh-huh. So you leave that <laughs> scene. You come to Crockett. Crockett, he's in Miami. He's living fast, right? You go then. Then you get the scene where the car bomb goes off, kills kills his partner. Then then he has to go tell his his partner's wife, who's pregnant, that he's dead. Then we go to Crockett going to his son's birthday party. Crockett had one hell of a day, right? Yeah, and he yeah, walks. You telling me? all like scuffed up with all kinds of stuff like all over him from when the explosion happens like and bits nobody... of brain and skull still <laughs> yeah. att- still on he him just, he just shows up to his son's six year birthday party with like pieces of his partner on his suit that's cool it's average yeah. and, and everybody else in the party blows it off nobody it, no like nobody questions it at all oh yeah because it's like supposed to be the 80s divorce family like he's supposed to be a deadbeat right he's married to his job so they're immediately like where you been how come you're late you know how, how come you're being such a dick boy how far we have come because i was like oh man and he still manages to show up for his kid's birthday party and he brought a present <laughs> like that's a dedicated <laughs> dad right there <laughs> meanwhile you know like in the 80s that was some sort of deadbeat but now it's like i watch you know some other crime drama and they don't even acknowledge that they have a kid or like they're a horrible parent and they're still married or something do you ever notice that that stigma with cops like you look at any uh, you look at the dial franchise bruce willis divorced with kids drinks um like that's always seems to be the dynamic of yep. of the the detective um uh it, like i wonder if that's true are, are are cops shitty parents is that is that just like something known that i just don't know about well i guess it's supposed to be like they're married to their job Nothing else is more important than catching the bad guy at the detriment of their family, right? That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, that they're like putting in all mm-hmm. these long hours and they're always away and the job always comes before everything. So, it, yeah, I mean, I guess I get that, but it just doesn't it didn't seem to follow through, right? Because he totally was there and he keeps calling in and and he's like blown away that his son's already six and he just seems much more connected to his his family and their life than you know than one would assume being yeah you know a mm. divorcee who lives on a boat with an alligator yeah. he also <laughs> seems pr- pretty sane for a uh for uh from a vietnam vet so yeah so we leave that scene we leave like it's he's at his son's birthday party and you learn about him being divorced and all that stuff the next scene that we go to is Tubbs. He's uh, coming down to Miami, and he's in. The, and it's that scene where he's in the strip club, having a good time. I guess being a Jamaican. I just have to know. <laughs> like, I was blown away by how much she was sweating. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it, that, it, it's not. It's not even a normal amount of sweat. And I just have to wonder why everyone in the '80s sweat so much. Like, I feel like we've now we've watched several movies and TV shows from the '80s, and there's always an excessive amount of sweat. But Tubbs by far takes the cake because he is staring up at this stripper, and he is like dripping wet with sweat. It's yes. gross. <laughs> well, it's that that court scene too, where they're. You know, and I'm I'm forgetting the order where the court scene happens, but the court scene happens, and in there they they talk about like it's so hot, and everyone is just covered in sweat in that room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, getting back to um, Tubbs coming down to Miami, um, it's kind of impressive that you know he's in Miami for what two days, and he's already. Um, 
hooking up with a guy to buy massive amounts of cocaine. Yeah, yeah, it's like um, like Tango and Cash last night when we were watching that. Yeah, you know, where Kurt Russell's telling Stallone, he's like, "You're not much of a cop because I already I've gotten as far as you have in just you know an hour or so, or w- whatever the line is." Like it's essentially that. T- Tubbs mm-hmm. come down, and just starts kicking ass. Meanwhile, Crockett's been fucking around for years trying to get this guy. Yeah, yeah, and I mean they don't show you at all how he figured out to go to the strip club, how to meet up with the eventual, I guess, DEA agent who we think is Mm -hmm. the drug dealer at the time like we have no idea he just shows up from new york and goes you know what i bet you they sell coke in there (laughs) (laughs) and i better be jamaican just in case (laughs) because that'll make it believable (laughs) are there a lot of jamaicans in new york in the 80s was that big then I mean, like in Queens or something, right? Maybe? I don't know. I'm trying to think of like other 80s movies that might have had large Jamaican populations. (laughs) I mean, I'm not questioning a Jamaican in Miami, but a Jamaican in Miami from New York? um... Look, at the basics of it, we can say that nobody questions much in this show, okay? Yeah. That's just how it breaks down. So Tubbs is able to... to facilitate a deal crockett is able to do the same thing he goes and talks to his guy well sorry he jumps in the car and tells him at gunpoint what's gonna happen uh, <laughs> those are two very different scenarios by the way just having a conversation <laughs> yeah. and breaking into a car and like talking to someone at gunpoint yeah yeah so you know he jumps over the into the car he pulls the gun he tells him you know like I need to get my money back. And, and the guy tells him, like, look, the people that you're dealing with are you're in over your head. You're not going to be able to handle them. But they're able to facilitate that deal. And we come to where that deal is going to happen. And I think that this scene is, is that happens at the docks where Tubbs and Crockett finally meet and they're on either side of the drug deal. I think that this scene is really going to set up the way the, way the, the show is from then on. In that they're on either side and the deal is about to go down and the cops, the rest of the police force, the Miami police force comes too early and fucks it up. And and there are two guys on the Miami police force that are like sidekick kind of humor, right? They're like slapstick, like, mm-hmm. oh, we're so stupid, right? They, and there was a couple times that episode mm-hmm. where, where they had that. So the police come and they mess everything up and it fucks up whatever Crockett has been working on. And now he's got to claw his way back. And I think that's probably going to be a theme based on every cop show since Miami Vice has the same theme. Right when the detective is going to get super close to being able to make his bust, the regular dumbass put police come in and fuck everything up yep yep so and i was also curious too about the the two other undercover girls is that is that an attempt at cagney and lacy right there i don't know but of course of course it'd be in the 80s and they're two female police officers what are they they're deep undercover as prostitutes right Uh, i know i know of course and there's one white one and one one, just to equal it out. They have to be the white version of Crockett and Tubbs. Uh, the white, uh, I mean, the female version of Crockett and Tubbs. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the scene at the docks, and then so Tubbs runs, and he jumps in the boat, and he starts driving away. And Crockett, he's going to chase him in his car. And it made me think of the episode of The Simpsons with Night Boat. <laughs> the crime <laughs> song. <laughs> uh-huh. And, of course, he's, like, chasing him in his car, and he's able to – and then, like – Tubbs looks like he's getting away. And then magically, because Don Johnson's some sort of superhuman, he's on the bridge that Tubbs is going to go underneath. I mean, I just assume that get- he could be in multiple places at once. That that's just something they haven't introduced yet. But he is also a magician. And once again, <laughs> obviously Tubbs, not very familiar with boats, um... Why is he getting away by driving along the road? <laughs> it, it seemed very easily. You could easily get away, make a right turn, and then there's nothing. Cro- You've stymied him. Crockett cannot recover. <laughs> I, I don't know, but 
Crockett jumps into the boat. They have a fight. They realize they're both police officers. And then it sets up, you know, the talk back and forth where they're on the bridge. And, and Crockett's very upset that, that he didn't know that Tubbs was a police officer. And there's that whole discussion, right? And then mm-hmm. there's some stuff that happens. And then there's, like, the other scene that I think is going to define the show, which is when Tubbs comes in the morning to come pick up Crockett. And this is exactly what uh, you were talking about, John. He comes to pick up Don Johnson or Crockett, and of course he lives on a boat. And, he, uh, and uh-huh. because he right, he's a he's a detective who's married to his job, and he's in so deep that he can't get his shit together. And, and part of living there is you know is is him being a, a, a undercover, but he sleeps late, which meaning that he probably stays up late drinking. Tubbs gets up real early in the morning. Oh, right. there's no, there's no even no question for that because there are several instances throughout the show that uh, Don Johnson, that Crockett reminds him that he only gets a few hours, maybe four hours of sleep of night. That's why he has the five o'clock shadow because he only sleeps like maybe four hours a night. Like they complete, they repeat it numerous times just yeah. in case you yeah. forgot. Not to, not to mention the intentional pan across after he's on the boat with one of. Um, one of the undercover girl cops and you see him wake up in the morning, you see him pan across and there's that half drink bottle of wild Turkey there. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. The wild Turkey and American spirits. Yeah. I saw uh-huh. that. Uh-huh. <laughs> so but hold on. Cause we need to talk about Crockett and Gina. Like that needs to be a separate thing, but we, we can, we can finish recapping. Let me get episode, further into the episode. But I, I'm I'm not I'm not ready to let that go just yet. So, <laughs> so like Tubbs is on the boat and they're joking around and uh, Crockett punches him right and then Tubbs gets up and of course Tubbs punches him right back. But they look they're gonna be cool. Everything's all right. And then we, then Tubbs meets the alligator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What <laughs> I just I can't. I can't figure out why he has an alligator, and that they've to- they totally play up the um they play up the Peter Pan joke because yeah. the alligator swallowed a what a uh, an alarm clock, so he t- an alarm clock. Yeah, they they hooked him. Is is what he says. Yeah, yeah. Elvis the alligator. I'm just so confused so. as to why he owns an alligator. And so I think what's happening here, and and this is the theme that's going to happen throughout the show, you know, go, forever, I think, is that they're trying to bring some local Florida flavor. And this is exactly what you're talking about, John, is that since even before the 80s, Florida was known for being dumb. Yes. Yes. Florida has it's been Florida. They have always been the dumb redneck florida everyone gets confused when they everyone thinks of miami beach and that's not florida florida yeah. is swamps Friendship pet ninjas. alligators that's and that's like the whole scene with them in the court and even the stenographer court stenographer pulls out a big ass gun well like, i mean that, yeah like, and she's like the last one to put her gun away too uh, uh, yeah like that's florida That's redneck, stupid Florida. That's where all those news stories come from. Yeah, and that's that's a good scene. Like, they're in the courthouse. The Miami police have set up to say that they've given him a deal because he's going to speak, and now it's going to make that guy really desperate, right? And that's what you were talking about is that there's some questionable police decisions here because they do that and then they can't actually protect him and you know he ends up being killed down at the beach uh, i mean he wasn't yes. gonna get killed anywhere else well, it was always as, gonna be at the beach and as soon as he gets killed crockett is telling Tubbs, well that's what under like that's what it means to watch your like watch your guy or something like that like do surveillance and like protect your witness and everything and his dude's dead pressed up against the like candy shop on the beach yeah and once again to their and once again back to their souls as undercover cops the very first thing they do is don johnson starts announcing to everyone that they're (laughs) cops (laughs) yeah right after his was is murdered on the beach um so yeah they make it very just starts telling people i'm a cop everyone get back get back 
You know, it's like, wow, you know, you guys are really good at this whole undercover thing. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's some like tenants that are happening in this show that we see that they're probably going to stay around for the entire show. They're in Florida. They're, they're going to hit on that every opportunity they get. They're in Florida. Florida's full of rednecks and alligators i'm sure alligators <laughs> mm -hmm. alligators should be probably be a recurring name on the credits <laughs> yes <Elvis> the alligator <laughs> or just alligators in general like there's probably going to be there's the time the guy gets caught by the alligator in the swamp then there's the time that there's an alligator on the golf course then there's the time there's the alligator in the pool like i'm sure that's going to be used a lot yeah i'm ready for like yeah. the benny hill chase style episode through the swamp on one of those boats that have the big ass fans on oh, the back. Oh yeah, you know there's going to be one of those giant <laughs> yeah. fan boats. I'm so, I'm here for yeah. it. I'm ready. <laughs> oh yeah. So, and then the other so, tenant that I see is that there's there's going to be the bumbling Miami police department that aren't ever going to be able to get anything right. They're supposed to be at a time or a place and they're always going to mess it up. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah one thing and one thing too that i see that's going to be a recurring theme is that the drug dealer or bad guy in most of our episodes i have a sneaking suspicion is either going to be colombian or cuban i have a feeling we're going to get a lot of very uh, uh a lot of white guys with fake tans doing their best tony montana impressions <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can tell that this is all like pre, uh, I guess, pre our new world with terrorism and, and such, because they just took off at the end of that episode. They just took off on their water boat. No need to clear anything. Just, a, you know, an unidentified aircraft taking off from Florida. No need to check in with any airspace or anything. That thing would have been shot down uh -huh. in like 20 minutes. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. So then the last thing that I see is that is is crockett the way crockett is is that he's like you know he's a, a vietnam vet he's a detective he's had partners died he's divorced he, you know it, life for him is always going to be a struggle and the only way that he gets off is when is if he catches the bad guy that's the only way that he can that he can keep continuing to survive as long as he catches the bad guy and you're on crockett's team because of that because you feel bad for him and you want him to succeed because he's just hanging by a thread. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely. Like you I I found myself often rooting for Crockett because I feel like the dude can't get a win. You know, he tries, he shows up to his kid's birthday party, tries to be there and be and be positive and still seems to be, you know, the loser in his ex-wife's eyes or or whatever. Like that's that relationship continues to be strained even though he's trying to be present or whatever. And then jumping over to like him and Gina, like he's caught in this in this, you know, in between where he's in love with someone but uh, but starting to have feelings for somebody else and, and it's keeping him from being able to fully commit and he's trying to be a good guy. Like he gives her that rose and uh, like, I'm just, I'm so rooting for him. <laughs> I want things to work out for him. <laughs> he seems like and, a genuinely you know, good guy that people just keep getting the wrong idea about. And, and you know, I totally see with the, uh, with male Crockett and female Crockett, I, I totally see that on again. Are they going to be together? Are they, <laughs> are, uh, can, can they make it work? That, you know, dynamic that they're always going to be teasing throughout the whole show. You know, it's, it's every time it looks like it's going to work out, something happens and it doesn't work out. I love that they're um, making and, Gina a strong female character, which I feel like was something that was kind of very hit or miss in larger 80s programs. But I mean, well, and I guess arguably today as well, but, but she really is like, she stands up for herself. She's wary to get committed to him or do anything with him. And then after the whole incident on the boat with, with him and saying his ex-wife's name in the morning or whatever, like she still remains very candid with him and stands up for herself. Like she's not going to keep, she's not going to keep doing this knowing that she's playing second fiddle to somebody else. Right. So she's going to, she'll walk away if she needs to, even though she doesn't really want to. And she thought that she was being better than, than to give in to him and she shouldn't have in the first place. Like, I don't know. I really like Gina. I think that as far as 
like uh tertiary characters go i feel like they've already really built her out and i'm kind of interested to see where they where they take her i see i don't feel that way i think she's still kind of a superficial character to me character to me that's why i refer to her as female crockett and i will continue to refer to her as female crockett until uh she becomes something more than that that's just your male privilege. <laughs> so um, can't, can't argue that. I, I am can't interested argue. for I, I I am interested for female tubs to actually get a speaking part in this. Can, um, wait, I, I do I do have one <laughs> one note to point out when Gina, not female Crockett, when Gina and Crockett are talking in the bathroom. And I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but I could swear that when she's taking out all of her stuff and there's already like a bunch of shit up lined up on the mirror, right, of the women's bathroom, there's birth control there, which felt like very progressive to have something like that out and visible in the 80s. I, I mean, it just still felt like very much like a time where obviously like people were making smarter decisions, but like it wasn't so widely advertised. and. Well- I mean, they are playing prostitutes, but, like, they aren't supposed to actually be going back and actually sleeping with these people. <laughs> so it felt like like a little a little weirdly, you know, just placed there. And, and when they pan to Crockett as Gina's leaving, like, you can just see it over his shoulder. I don't know. It caught me off guard. Well, I think that we've gone on long enough for this uh, – for – for right now and i think that we should cut it off and do another episode on part two of the pilot where we can really dig further into this stuff oh wait 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 because we haven't addressed the best scene the Go phil for collins it. car scene well i i think that i think we saved that for the next episode we cover the second half of this pilot and because right now we pretty much covered step by step through the through the first half of the pilot and then we'll, we needed to cut, come back and spend a lot more time on the second half where things start to button up and we see how the relationship of Tubbs and crockett is going to work that's fine i yeah, guess i'll put yeah, my so. lionel richie cover band together while we wait <laughs> 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 So, Jenna, what are your closing thoughts being someone that was born after the show had done it had done its run? You're you're looking back now, having never lived any part of Miami Vice. What is your final take on this first half of the pilot episode? The music. Like I was so struck at how often they use no dialogue, just straight music forward cutaway kind of moments. And it was all modern music. Like, it wasn't just some sort of like piano track or something like that. It was ta- like songs that were relevant of that time. And they played throughout, even when there was, you know, scenes that were dialogue heavy, but it, it kind of kept feeling almost cinematic with the moments where they're like, where they're riding in the car and Phil Collins is playing. I like, I just, I loved that. And it's something that, um, I guess I could connect a lot more to shows that I've seen since this has gone off the air. Mm-hmm. So its influence uh, was a lot wider reaching than I realized. And it sounds like you are on the bandwagon now to be fully in love with Don Johnson. I'm so in love with Don Johnson. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm just, I'm so ready to commit to this. My body so. is ready. <laughs> I'm prepared. I'm writing my Don Johnson fanfic <laughs> while we wait. So between episodes, oh man, him and Gina for life. <laughs> Screw the ex-wife. So, okay, and John, what is your final thought on this first half of the pilot episode? My final thought is that coming into this, um, the remake movie was the only thing I had really seen uh, 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 about Miami Vice. And my initial thought is Colin Farrell does not even come close to a good Crockett. He does not live up to Crockett at all. Um, so, uh, and seeing this cop flick, I am so excited. I'm seeing all these different uh, shows mixed in there that that uh, spurred from this show. So uh, I'm excited for um, lots of classic 80s cop moments. <laughs> so, and I can say from my from my perspective on this, you know, my final thought on this. My wife, or, you know, Melissa, she is super excited that we are watching this show. She is the biggest Miami Vice fan. 
probably out there ever. No one it comes to close to how big of a Miami Vice fan she is. Every day leading up to us watching this episode, we watched it on Thursday, she was sending me gifts of Miami Vice. So <laughs> there was a lot of excitement in the house to watch this first episode. In fact, she is watching season four on her own on a rewatch and watching season one with me. So there's a lot of excitement in the house, a lot of, you know, I was ready to watch it. I am not much of a TV person. And on top of that, I am not much of a police procedural or police drama show. The only police show I have watched is The Wire. And it's hard for me to gauge any show because The Wire is just that. It's that show. It is so good. It is so excellent. But I see Miami Vice in The Wire. You know, I see Miami Vice in other shows that I have watched. I was really surprised at how good that first episode was. And 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 I was caught off guard that I was writing less notes because I was paying more attention to what was happening in the show. And I was really surprised at how well it was. I actually cared about the characters. It was actually pretty gritty for being a TV show in the 80s. Again, it's not from cable. It was on NBC. It was. It may have been on a Friday night, so they got a bit away with a little bit more. But it was still surprising what they were doing in that show comparison to what else was happening on TV at the time. So mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to watching more episodes of this show. And I'm also looking forward to more tropes, more stereotypes and being way further over the top because you know that once the show makes a transition over to the next generation of writers and it's gained in popularity that those stereotypes are going to hit 11. Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah. So, and whereas your yeah, wife was sending just... you gifts, I can tell you that my husband who has absolutely no idea that this show even existed before we started doing this because he's just that out of pop culture. The only connection that he had was the video game based off of it, like the the Grand Theft Auto that's been based yeah. off of it, and he felt a little a little wanting, right? Because nobody ran over a hooker or anything, <laughs> right? So, but I think we have room to grow. He seemed interested, so. <laughs> well, I yeah, think that's I gonna mean, just go ahead, John. Go ahead. One uh, one final thing, like with. Uh, I'm a huge NCIS fan, and it, in that show, the character Gibbs, uh, played by Mark Harmon, it's a really iconic character nowadays. Um, uh, people love his character, that. And I'm seeing, just in that first episode, I'm seeing why Crockett is one of those iconic characters. I see why people who are fans of the show just loved Don Johnson character. Yep. Yep. Totally. So I think that's going to about wrap it up. We have a lot more to discuss on what happens in the second, in the second half of this pilot. Cause a lot of shit goes down. So that's going to sum it up for this week. Check back next week when we cover the second half of the pilot episode and we continue to break down this, as we know now the greatness that is Miami vice until next time. We'll see you next week. Bye pals. Stay fresh, people. Word to your mother. I can totally, like, I, now I really feel for people who didn't live in the age of DVR because so much happened in that first half. Like, how would you even cover all of that? We oh, were yeah. running, like, we were running yeah. out of time with you, like, quickly recapping several key instances throughout the first half. I felt like I watched a movie. Well, and think about it. Like, if if you had a question about something or if you didn't catch something right away, you may not ever see that episode again. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. Was- that's what I was going to say. Like, to give you guys an example, like, I missed the uh, first couple episodes of Supergirl. So I've been waiting for the season to end so it'll be, be released on demand and then I can just binge watch it. If you missed that first episode and it first came out, like how lost are you going to be starting episode three? Like you yes. missed all of that? Right? Like there's already we have so much background on a number of characters. It wasn't even I mean, obviously they did hone in the most on Crockett, but there's so much background given. Now I like I wanna know more about 
uh, Tubbs's brother, like the real Raphael Tubbs. Yeah. And I want to know where the money's coming from that Crockett's boss, because nobody, like, they pitch him as be- possibly being the leak, but then obviously you find out, and we didn't even address it in this, but like, obviously you find out that it's his longtime friend and old partner who was the actual leak. But then that makes you think, where is mm. the boss? Like, then, then, how are you even addressing where the boss is getting the money to send his kid to that fancy ass school? Like, that's still an open ended question. Are there more than one one leak in the department? Yeah. So I just can't even imagine like trying to get all that information when you come in on on episode two, and only getting the that like thirty second recap of what happened last week. Right. I yeah. guess it also explains mm-hmm. to me why so many of these were able to be made into like novellas or, you know, like like published format of the work. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. And if you imagine like, you know, I'm not watching Miami Vice right now. I don't I, I'm not going to watch that show. I don't have time. And then you come to work and at, by episode six, everyone at work is like, oh, man, you got to turn on Miami Vice. You got to watch this show. And so you go turn it on. And you're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, all right, guys, I'm going to run upstairs because WrestleMania is about to end, and I want to see who wins. 